My name is Monica Gleberman, and you're listening to Silence On Set Podcast. On today's podcast, we have Clay Epstein, who's the president of Film Mode Entertainment and co-chair of IFTA and AFM. So to talk about why it's so important for filmmakers to go to AFM, what IFTA does, and what is the latest coming out of Film Mode Entertainment, here is Clay Epstein. So obviously, I'm so excited to talk with you. I you're in charge, I feel like, of everything, every little aspect kind of in the entertainment industry. I kind of come across your name in one in one way or another for people that don't know you, which I don't know how, because I feel like if you're in this industry, you know, Clay Epstein. But if we don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about your background, your film company, uh, you know, AFM, how you kind of got involved in all of that? Well, I kind of wear two hats. So I have my, my professional hat. Uh, I own a company, Film Mode Entertainment, and we are a worldwide sales agent, which means we represent distribution rights for producers. And with that, we executive produce the majority of our projects, which really means we help the filmmakers get their films made regarding on what sort of help they need, right? We kind of think of ourselves as a 360 degree conduit between the filmmaking team, the marketplace, and the consumer. Um, I've had the company for six years. We're selling celebrating our sixth year, which we're proud of ourselves, right? And it's, of course, not just me, it's the team and, and everyone that supported us. So I'm proud of what we've accomplished in six years. And prior to that, I, I ran sales at previous companies before Arclight Films and some companies that don't exist anymore, but I went to film school. I mean, I actually grew up in the movie business in terms of a professional. Um, I grew up in LA, but there was no one in my family in the entertainment business. Perhaps growing up in Los Angeles, I still saw the potential of a dream. I think a lot of people right. come to LA for a potential dream or something they've seen in the movies. And I stayed in LA to try and chase that dream. So I went to film school, got all those little assistant jobs, answering phones and doing runs and errands and keeping my eyes and ears open, hoping one day I would have my own company to be able to work with wonderful filmmakers and tell wonderful stories. Um, that's my day-to-day -day job. We have an incredible team based here in Los Angeles. And it's been it's been a dream come true, really, that I'm able to work with people I want to work with. That was really the goal. And that means filmmakers as well as distributors worldwide. So that's the film mode. That takes up the majority <laughs> of my time as well. And I, right. I'm responsible for, for you know everyone that works for us. And I believe in the cohesiveness of the independent entertainment industry. And when I say that, it's global. That's a global uh, reference to the entertainment industry. We actually have a film uh, out now called Spirit Halloween that we collaborated with the division of Warners with, which was phenomenal. Wow, okay. Outside of the times that, that we do overlap with the studio system, we are working with independent filmmakers filming uh fine film financing independent distribution and that is a different universe you know different parameters different uh skill set that's required to get films made there is one trade organization that exists in the world that has the best interests of the independent film community only one trade organization doesn't mean there's other organizations or guilds or unions that also have areas or elements that support the independent film community of course that exists. But there's only one trade organization in the world that is made up of independents as a board director of independence and its membership has nothing more but the best interests of independence at heart. That's called the, uh, the if IFTA, Independent Film and Television Alliance. I've been volunteering for this organization through my career for years. Even when I was younger in my career, I, I saw the, the importance of it. IFTA puts on the AFM. So one of the biggest things that it does is hosts the AFM every year. But it also lobbies governments, not just in the U.S., but internationally as well, to protect intellectual property and to protect uh, rights and distribution rights and to, to protect our business model and the voice of filmmakers, independent filmmakers worldwide. So they're heavily involved in that lobbying as well and, and educating legislators worldwide among many other things. So I volunteered for the organization through the years. There is a board of directors made up of its members. Yep, if you work at a member company, you can run for the board and then your colleagues elect you onto the board. Been on the board on and off through the years. And a year ago, I was elected as the chairperson. So I'm halfway through my first term as chairperson. So I am the chair of the board of directors. So I have a wonderful board uh, that I collaborate with. Um, I work closely with the president of IFTA, Gene Pruitt, who's incredible and been the president for, for 
for many years and has done an incredible amount for the independent film community. And I take this role seriously. I'm humbled by it. I'm challenged by it. I'm proud that uh, proud that my colleagues had their trust and faith in me. And probably some of them didn't want to do it themselves. So they said, <laughs> let's vote play in. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay with that. And so that is all volunteer. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not paid for this. I, I give many hours to the organization and to my colleagues. And I'm proud of it. And my colleagues are proud of it. Like, you know, for people that might not know anything about the industry, AFM is one of the largest, if not the largest, film markets where people from all over the world can come. There's speakers that talk from different companies. You could go to workshop. You can pitch. You can network. I mean, it's just one of the largest places to go in terms if you have a film, whatever scale the film is, and you can come and kind of pitch and meet. So it's it's really made a name for itself. And it's a place where all of us, even as journalists, follow because we all want to know who's buying it. You know, where is it going? Exactly. So announcements well, have been it, coming out like crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we, had a, we had an announcement yesterday. We had one today. Exactly. That, you know, IFTA is the only trade organization that has the best interest of the independence. AFM is the only show, the only trade show um, and film market that is only made up of independence. So we have studios come as buyers, but AFM is made up of its members. You don't have to be a member company to exhibit or to attend AFM, but AFM is all about independent film and independent voices. So we have a lot of commerce going on. I'm in my office now. They take all the beds out of the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica and we move in furniture and TVs. We can show trailers. And so the whole hotel is full of exhibitors, companies that have films to present to distributors worldwide. And then you have distributors attending from all over the world, meeting constantly. We're just in meetings all day long for the next week and there's parties and events. And then simultaneously, as you said, we have this incredible producer seminar series going yeah. on, which I've had the pleasure to moderate a panel every year. We moderate a panel about producers working with sales agents and we have a fantastic panel uh, this year. It's always great. This year is going to be really incredible. Very successful producers and sales agents talking about their experience working together, what to look out for, how to do contracts, how sales agents work. It's kind of pulling back the curtain behind that sales agent producer relationship so right. it's santa monica is buzzing we're throwing this you know it's like throwing a huge party for the independence certainly there's film festivals worldwide we all know sundance and tribe god can right. of course but all different types of films go to those festivals and those festivals are sometimes subsidized by their city or by their government or by sponsorship afm lives or dies by its own success right and that's kind of how an independent film works as well so it's you know not coincidental the market is like that also this is the 40 something market i've been coming i think for 20 i think my first market was 1999 um, as an assistant for a sales company and i thought i had made it right i thought i had made it when i came to um, afm in 1999 yeah I, I was just gonna say because i tell people that are in the journalism world or the pr world it's almost like the tcas for us where they set up a hotel and you get to interview a bunch of celebrities from different shows and it's just all day and it's like four days long and you go to workshops for people that are not in the industry at all I tell them it's a little almost like a like a vendor market where you kind of walk around if you were trying to sell your business that's kind of the idea of what it's like and you go but it's so exciting because it's one place that you're bringing together people from all over the right. world that would not Bring have all... the opportunity elsewhere exactly and to give your audience a bit of a, a sense of scope when Tarantino has a film it's usually sold at AFM or a mark like AFM, but if the timing works out, it's sold at AFM. So there's certainly been Tarantino films where they have found their distribution partners and financing at AFM. Same with when George Clooney directs a movie. Scorsese's had films at AFM before. So it's not just $5 independent films. We're talking about this wide spectrum, right? Because the, the term independent film is really referring to how a film is financed. It's not a genre, right? It's how films or finance, meaning independently financed from the studio system. Right. Like, so when people hear indie, they assume, oh, it was made for nothing. But in reality, an indie film is when you're going out to try to get funding that's not from a quote studio. So you're getting money Correct. from investors, 
from smaller companies, additional right. people want to come on as producers, exactly, and so on. So and absolutely, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a two million dollar they just threw together. It could be a huge multi million dollar blockbuster film. It's just how absolutely. they acquired the funds, and it might end up being released through a studio, right? Right? Yeah, or not? Or not? It really has to do with how it was financed and how the production came to be, how the how the rights and the, and the intellectual property was controlled. What the independent model enables filmmakers, usually, this is not all the time, but usually is a freedom of expression and vision, right? Yeah, because and then once they do it and everyone realizes it's incredible, the distributors, the studios, the whole world comes and says, well, you've proven, you financed it outside of our system, but we still want it, right? Or, or right. some, yeah. some then, sort of collaboration. Yeah, then you get that nice paycheck or whatever deal that they work out but, i would like that to happen <laughs> yeah but it but it is true um and i do think it's so valuable for so many people i want to get to a couple of questions about the industry in terms of what you think but i do want to mention you guys did make an announcement for your company so there's a couple of things for film mode entertainment i just want to bring it back there really quickly because i love film mode entertainment i think you guys put out great Thank you. Thank you. I'm and grateful. have currently Monstrous, which is like a huge movie with Christina Ricci. And yeah. I mean, like there's like really great talent connected to that. And I just wanted to like go over a few of them. They Crawl, I think, is another one that you guys have. Yeah, They Crawl Beneath. That's out now. Yeah. And then you guys have Santa Man. Which yeah. We love, we love all genres. It, we like films that have an audience. If someone says, what type of films does film mode work on or like to represent? Is there a particular genre special? in films that have an audience. It's not all movies. There are some films or projects that probably don't have an audience outside of the filmmaker's parents. Mm -hmm. So those might be difficult. But yeah, we're Monstrous with Ricci came out this year. You guys also we have very... one of my favorites, which was Dig with um, yeah. Thomas Jane and Harlow Jane. And Emil Hirsch. Yeah, and Emil yeah, Hirsch. Yeah, yeah, it, it, father, daughter together on screen. It is. Thomas and Harlow. And she's which... excellent. She's incredible. So good. I saw, I saw she's it. She's such a good actress. She's such a good actress. And I know he workshopped with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I saw like there was a couple of zooms we had even when we were determining if you know because she hadn't been the lead in a film before and he really works up with her. Emil Hirsch is great in the film, so that came out recently. We have we were very proud of our film as they made us. This is Maya Bialik's mm -hmm. yes. directorial debut, semi autobiographical about her family. Dustin Hoffman, Candace Bergen, Diana Egron, and Simon Helberg, and Maya directing it. Like this is like an incredible film. Had a really nice theatrical release earlier this year. The festivals have embraced it worldwide so that was a film we were we were involved in from the beginning from the script stage and work closely with mime and the producers to get it all the way to an audience and, uh really really delighted with how that film came out and we announced yesterday i unseen uh, this unseen which i am exciting. so i am so excited about this project because of the filmmakers it's a great concept imagine if you woke up blind Right. And you just woke up blind one day. So the, the the whole hook is that everyone in this town wakes up blind, except for the one girl that was blind and she wakes up with vision. And yeah. it's a sensory deprivation thriller like Bird Box or, or Quiet Place, kind of that concept. Right. Ted Field is producing. Ted Field is famous for Riddick, the Jumanji franchise, Wes Craven's They, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, on and on, just massive, massive franchises. And he's doing this really high concept independent genre film that's going to be directed by the Soska sisters and yeah. their producing partner Marty Katz who's Cronenberg's producer so we could not be more excited about the filmmaking team behind this project I and mean, that was announced yesterday on Halloween good. right perfect perfect time I feel like with each film that you guys choose there's always something special um, whether it's on the screen behind the scenes whatever the case is in Dig there's obviously something very special about Harlow's character but there's you know a lot of things even like with Mayim's like her film that were a little more behind the scenes but all it always just turns out a great product in the independent space that we work in you have to have something special about every film that you have because we don't have the luxury of money if you have endless funds you can spend your way in to a consumer's consciousness you're educating them with money and that's how the studios generally work which is great i mean it's a fantastic model right you can kind of calculate what your marketing spend is versus awareness you can then test the awareness because you have the money to test it they can even do like a quote i mean 
mean, it's estimated, but a rate of return, right? Like, so yeah, we this person in, we're expecting this right. much back. If we, right. if they can test money. and track it because they yeah. have funds to then pay companies to track it. But in the independent space, you know, when when you don't have the luxury of something in any, you know, art, sometimes wonderful art is the is the outcome of of not having something. You don't have the money or the materials or or something that you have to be more creative. Engineering is a lot of times amazing engineering comes from not having something, right? Being forced to go that extra distance by not having the luxury of everything at your fingertips. And the same is in filmmaking and film marketing. If you don't have the luxury of capital, you have to have something to compensate for that. And that's why we are attracted to these films. Yeah, it's something you can't pay for. So when you have Thomas and you have you know Harlow right. together you can't pay for that kind of chemistry that they have right you, can't, you know they're playing father daughter in the movie they're really father and right. daughter. you can't pay for what comes out on that screen and it was just beautiful right. and with my right. the same thing right she's so excited this is a huge deal for her a huge connections you got big stars on it you can't pay for that kind of excitement whereas some people maybe that are used to making these films over and over might not have the same excitement but they don't have to worry about it because like you said ads go out advertisements billion dollar things you know that they might not right. have to be as excited not saying that they all right. aren't but they don't have to worry as much yeah. and that excitement is what makes the movie special and you guys pump out these films that are just amazing to kind of i guess shift over really quickly for afm what are you kind of currently seeing in terms of budgets nowadays and you know selling in american markets versus international markets are you seeing like a huge kind of difference in terms of selling and then budgeting yeah budgets have shifted uh, a little bit up a little bit down we you know the gaps can be quite large right the challenge is that the cost of production keeps increasing so even if the values of films decrease in some aspects the cost to make them continues to increase like everything else in the world and every other industry there's just deflation of course we like to go guild and union when we can so that it, it just adds to the budget you know to do really low budget under a million let's say six hundred thousand it's that that's going to be probably challenging to do you know all union and guild in some regards and depending on where you shoot the film right so shooting a film internationally let's say the uk sometimes you can do more for less because of the infrastructure there depending right. on what type of film let's say you do a period we have a a Three Musketeers film. Well, they didn't have to build a castle. There was a castle. So they went and shot at the castle, right? So they didn't have to build it. In the US, you'd have to build the castle or a set. So that would add an extra cost. So deciding where to shoot a film is very important to the overall budget, and not only with incentives from that city, state, or country, but also logistically and practically. But we've seen the budgets kind of go from that under million, then they kind of jump from one five to two, then they jump to three, and then there's sums that hover in four. I think it's difficult for films in the four million space to work. They cost too much for what they're worth, but they don't cost enough to get to the next level because the next level is then in the eights to 10, I think. And that really needs to be dictated by cast, right? You can't have a seven or $8 million movie and have no significant actor in it. You can't have a $4 million movie and have no significant actor in it. And those budgets come from, you know, what the marketplace will support for films that cost that amount. Right. And so, and unlike the studios that may have distribution in place, we are always relying on our partners worldwide to say, yes, we'll take a crack at that or we'll take a risk on that. We, we have an opportunity to work on that. We'll put the bandwidth and our resources behind. So you're asking your partners to risk their finances. Right. So our job has a lot to do with risk mitigation. Uh, to, to get back to the value of films, uh, right. North America is still the most valuable territory. The last few years, this has shifted, but the last few years, North America is usually the U.S. is worth about half of the overall world value in minimum guarantees. That's the advance that you're asking for distributors to give you. It used to be several years ago that you would sell international and hold the domestic until your film was finished. And then you would try and have a bidding war with the domestics. Mm -hmm. That trend started to fade away when we were reliant on the domestics to pre-buy the films to help finance them. And if they were going to give Give you a million dollars before the film was made uh it was safest and you know you needed that contract to get the film financed and in many instances 
when you're selling a film before it's made, you are selling the dream and hope of it being excellent. Once it's done, the distributor is going to pay you the face value of what the execution is. No matter what your hope and dream and expectation was with the filmmakers, now you have the film and the distributor is saying, well, I've just evaluated it for what it is. I'm not evaluating it for what it's going to be. And so there's also a difference in just how deals can be structured and negotiated. It's very competitive here in North America as well amongst the distributors. And that's another reason why the pre-sale market is quite active, right? Most of the films are pre-sold in North America. See, and that's a, a good kind of like segue into my next question, which was, you know, I talked to a lot of people that are screenwriters trying to sell their screenplay, right? They're trying to get their films off the ground. Some of them are half funded that they've been able to do. They're looking for more money, you know, whatever the case is. And they come to AFM. They look to IFTA. They come to the, for you guys for resources, for help. So how do you guys come together? I know you mentioned some of it, but how do you guys come together to work with some of these people that come to these events and are like, you know, they have a project. What do you guys do to try to help them to move forward with the filmmaking process? Yeah, we did. Um, I was on a, on a Zoom panel that IFTA put together about a month and a half ago with the president of IFTA, Gene, and myself. And there was a couple other really experienced executives. And I think there were three, 400 filmmakers, producers, people that wanted to come to AFM, thinking about coming to AFM. So even if people had come before, you know, didn't have the memory because it was too, you know, over two years ago or wanted to be more proactive about it. We had this really wonderful educational seminar, you know, we took questions and it was all about preparation. And what I kept telling the, the audience is, you know, if you if you properly prepare for your market, you're going to have a better result. And, and like anything in life, I mean, I prepare to come to the market and this is my 20 something year. So if you as a producer or want to be trying to find a partner to help make your film or you have a film you want to find a sales agent for, you also have to prepare for your market. You can't expect just to show up and find success, right? right. And that preparation comes from materials, whether it's a trailer, a deck artwork, have your marketing materials, information about the film, schedule meetings, try and reach out to potential partners beforehand. Now that might be difficult to book meetings with people that don't know you, but at right. least you've reached out, at least you've tried, and then attend the seminars and try and do some networking. And we also said it may not happen all at one AFM. It may take two or three AFMs to start trying to network with sales agents and executives to to get to the point where they know you and you can get a response to your email. That was the advice we gave. Is our door open? Yes. Do we like producers we don't know that have never made a film that aren't professional filmmakers that are willing to get into the business interrupt us during our meetings with our clients? No, I'll be honest and say, no, that's not really, that doesn't really work for us, right? This yeah. is a professional environment. We're not open to the consumer. This is not a consumer trade show. This is a, this is a business to business trade show. These incredibly, incredible seminars are downstairs, but I love telling the story that there was a young female uh, director that made the film. This was 2017 or 2018. She came to my seminar. She sent me an email. She came later. She says, I'd like just to shake your hand. I appreciated hearing your seminar. I made a film. Here's the trailer. Let me know if you're interested. And we ended up acquiring her film and sold it worldwide. And she's gone on to do commercials and, and other projects. So she handled herself so professionally. She had a great film when it was very well done and she was very talented. But right. she handled herself professionally. And that had a lot to do with it. And do you, what, what would your advice be in terms of, you know, when I talk to filmmakers, a lot of them have the pitch deck and like kind of like tr the traditional yeah. materials that you would yeah. show. Is there yeah. one that you feel like is valued more than the other? Is there one that they should spend time on more than another? Because, you know, I feel like some things like in terms of looking at scripts, it gets monotonous, right? Like everyone looks the same. Right. Pitch decks right. are all formatted the same. Right. Letters are all formatted the same. What is it to you that would be like a supplemental material that would stick out? Right. The, the most important material or supporting material is a trailer or promo. Um, you it's It's quick, right? Right? It's two and a half to three minutes. You get an idea of everything. Who's in it, production value, the story, the genre. And you're not asking someone to sit and read a script for two hours or to go through a pitch deck. Trailer really is, is the most important. A poorly edited trailer is worse than anything. So if you are going to do a trailer, which you should, have it professionally made. You're going to go through all this effort and work to go make a film. And you're really trying to chase a dream or you're trying to uh, get into a, a 
or profession that you really want to, why save two, three grand at the last minute for the most important? important bit of material to try and convince an executive to get to have faith in you have it professionally edited do not edit it yourself do not have your friend who knows final cut maybe that's does no idea how to cut a promo at trailer and at promo editing is a very specific skill set there are people that do nothing but cut trailers that's what they do for a living they cut trailers that's who you should have cut your trailer as a professional even if it costs a little bit extra to have like a really experienced editor it's worth it the opposite of that is like i said having a poorly edited trailer or one that's clearly edited by the filmmaker that doesn't really know how to use editing software wrong music wrong pacing shots look bad does it not color corrected didn't pick the right moments that's detrimental I mean, we're never, you're not going to get an email back or call back. And for, you know, I always tell people when they've asked me advice, especially because I do some, you know, PR, when it comes up, I All always right. say, you know, sometimes if you give someone a pitch deck or a script or whatever the case is, and they do have time to look over it, sometimes they're not seeing your vision, right? They're seeing what they picture in their brain. It's almost yeah. like you read a book. So when you give someone yeah. a trailer, even if it's like a mock, quote unquote, like you don't have anything really filmed yet, but if you invest and make it, you're selling your vision. So they're seeing yeah, good point. What, what you're kind of making or what you want to make, and then they can make a decision and at least you're on the same page. Whereas if you submit something else and they love it and then you have a meeting and you guys are completely on separate pages because you read it one way and they are trying to push it another way. Right. So I yeah, always think yeah. that visual helps in terms of kind of trying to sell what you're looking to do. Good point. That's a very good point. I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So so that's interesting that that's like something. So that's, that's good to know, like for people listening, you know, if they want to, you know, if they have a pitch deck, it, it's worth the money to invest and make a promo, a trailer, something officially, effectively, and then send it in yeah. the most professional way that they can follow up, get those emails, that kind of thing. And then I was curious too, I know that there's a gap between projects being funded and casted and do we cast someone with a name first? Do we sell it and try to get a name? You know, there's so much of like the chicken before the egg kind of situation, yeah. right? When you're selling a film. So what's another type of tip that you would give someone? Is it important to, I guess, if you're lucky enough to come forward with a name attached to the film, even if it's a letter of intent where like they might not be right. the, the person that is actually in it at the end. But is that more important? To, is that something that they should focus on? Or does it is it irrelevant? Or is it better to come with a clean slate? You know, what would you kind of suggest in that scenario? Because there's a lot of filmmakers that don't know what to do. They're like, oh, I have this great film. And, you know, it could be the best film ever. But they don't have an actor attached. And they go, oh, well, no one's going to take it because I have nobody attached to it. And then there's other right. people who have people attached to it. So what's kind of better for you in terms of picking up something like that? Well, you're right in saying there's nothing more important than who's in the film because the cast is really what is what is such key in our business the way that we cast the films that we that we work on generally is the producers give us a cast list after speaking with agents for availability and kind of budget level and then say here are 10 names that we feel we are can get they're available they could you give us your input on the marketplace and who you feel would be a fit and if we can get that creative fit and the commercial fit to overlap that's your list of where to start right but with with filmmakers at the beginning that are trying to build traction that don't have any agent relationships, I usually say hire a casting director, right, to get some help because the casting director, that's what they do for a living, right? They know the agent, they know availability, and they know who might be looking, who what actor might be willing to do an independent film with a new director. And if they do come to our door or send us an unsolicited email and they have someone attached that we know, that could get a, a response, right? So yes, uh, I, I think if you're a starting a filmmaker that's just starting out that has no relationships and trying to build traction, having an interesting actor is great. The sales agent may say, look, we like everything, but we want to replace the actor. At least you've gotten them on board. And there's some actors that are really easy to get attached that don't help you know, us sell projects, I suppose. There's probably some actors that are just a bit saturated and nevertheless, the, the filmmaker still has to try and start packaging their project because otherwise you're asking a sales agent to do everything. We're not producers. We're executive producers. We're sales agents. We can help in many, many regards, but we're not doing the day-to-day -day heavy lifting of putting a project together from scratch. You still right. need a producer. And if you're not a producer and you really want to be a director, then you probably need to go partner with someone who wants to be a producer or who is a producer to help you do that. No, that and that makes sense. And I think that's... I, it's invaluable advice hearing it, you know, from yeah. you and with all of your experience that you have, I want to ask for my final kind of question is what 
how would you sum up AFM, IFTA, if you had like two sentences or like, you know, a really short summary as to why people, wherever they are in the movie making process, should come to AFM or try to be invested or contact IFTA to get help? What what would be like your kind of, I guess, your pitch of AFM? And yeah, IFTA? sure. Uh, AFM is the nucleus of the independent film industry. Mm-hmm. So my pitch would be, if you're not here, you're not serious about making movies. No, oh, and that's good. Yeah, because there's, I mean, literally everybody goes there. <laughs> so it's such a huge, yeah. uh, huge... If you're not here, if you're not here, then you're not you're not serious and you're not making your film and it's just just a pie in the sky dream you know everyone who is a professional and in the independent community is here and it is like i said the only event anywhere in the world that is completely devoted cohesively to the independent film community so you have to be here yeah and there's so many resources so many networking people you can meet i mean just it's endless what could basically happen at afm kind of like the place that you need to be it's the the hub it's the hub we're in la and then within la it's the hub for the independence and then to go back to film mode entertainment which you know like i said i'm a huge fan i'm super excited thank you heard about unseen we put it up online we were so excited about it oh great thank you oh my gosh we're so excited the the concept sounds amazing i know it's based off a video game Twisted Sister, you know, kind of taking in and taking charge of it. It's going to be fantastic. We're all so excited about it. I'm assuming probably next, sometime next year, we would hear more. Or yeah, we plan on shooting in, uh, we plan on shooting in March. So okay. we hope to have a film by the beginning of 2024. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it just, that's just the time it takes, but it's worth it. It's worth the wait. And everyone's going to hear the progress because the sisters have such a huge following on social media. I mean, they're famous in their own right. I mean, they are, they have such an enormous amount of followers, rightly so. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan myself, so (laughs) I'm sure they're going to be kind of dropping hints and and this and that on their socials to keep the fans excited, you know, and anxious. Are there any other, no, obviously I know you're like, if you have other projects that you're going to kind of connect with, or there might be some that you meet at AFM while you're there. Are there any plans of making future announcements for the rest of the week? I mean, we had, we announced a really fun film in Cannes that we um, that we're getting really close on in, into production, right? So this is called All My Friends Are Dead, and it's from the producers of Happy Death Day and and Marcus Dunstan, who's directing, wrote Saw Two and Three D, and uh, he's one project at Greenlight. I mean, this guy is the person to direct the film. This will probably start shooting also the beginning of next year. So we'll have some announcements about this film that we haven't announced yet so that's exciting and we may have a few other announcements for you we have a few new projects that were you know we we don't want to we don't want to say everything at once that's no fun of course i know you have a few tricks up your sleeves i know you i know you guys thank you so much for for having me and i look forward to talking to you again soon it's great we love the support thank you so much and then just really quickly where can people find out about film mode entertainment we still do a lot on facebook it's film mode entertainment that's it's at film mode entertainment and then we have instagram as well i think it's film mode entertainment with underscores between the words um but yeah please join our socials because we put a lot of information up there and fun photos and behind the scenes and certainly during the market we have a lot of lot going on on there so that would be great if your audience okay well perfect yes and we'll include that if you guys are listening in the description so there'll be links to the website to facebook and to social so you guys can follow great thank you i hope you guys enjoyed listening to clay epstein talk about ifta afm upcoming projects from Film Mode Entertainment, and of course, some advice that he had for upcoming filmmakers. Make sure to check out his latest films by going to filmmodeentertainment.com. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you're updated on all of our latest podcasts. And head over to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe so you're updated. 